Good morning. You guys know I'm a Christian counselor and I frequently work with people who deal with mood swings. I was reading about Jeremiah today in my Bible, just my Bible quiet time. And he says in verse 13 of chapter 20, sing to the Lord, give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. Great statement. The next verse. Cursed be the day I was born. May the day of my mother bore me not be blessed. I'm going, he went through, he just said, sing praise to the Lord, and now he's saying, cursed be the day I was born. Within a short period of time. Why would that be taking place? I did some, I was talking to a pilot friend of mine, and I asked him if his plane had a governor on it. And he said yes. So I did some research. The governor, small g, is, it, it stops the engine, or the, it stops the propellers from surging if the engine surges. So the propellers are gonna go the same speed regardless of what the engine does. It's called a governor. Isaiah 60, 17 says, I will make peace your governor, small g. God gives us peace to stop the mood swings. I think Jeremiah needs P, B, and J. He needs peace, balance, and joy. Go back to my pilot friend again. I ask him, what would happen if the propeller, the props on the plane were out of balance? He said, it would vibrate, it would cause harm to the engine, we would probably crash. We need peace as a governor and we need balance, but we also need joy in life. Now, John, I know you're a, you're a fan of, of West Lafayette, the school in Purdue. I, I predicted them to win the whole thing. My joy, I felt like I was in Mudville. <laughs> Mighty Casey had struck out. But here's what's ironic. Because God's in control, I should always have continual joy. My, my joy. My peace, my balance doesn't come from life, it comes from God. Let's stand and worship. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? Break at the way. 
Father God, we live in a world that can make us have mood swings. But God, you give us peace and balance and you give us joy. God, help us to always recognize you're with us, you're for us, you're always involved in our lives. God, you're always in control. The prop of the plane always goes the speed you want it to go. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for being a God who gives us love, who has mercy for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you'd like, you can be seated. So 
Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. Sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me. Let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy.
So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and say. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. God, we do pray that it would be true in our lives that we can claim we need you. We pray for your power in our lives. We pray for your Holy Spirit's guidance and power. Thank you for your conviction. We pray that your spirit would move in this service now and that we would see life change this morning. Thank you for your love. In Christ's name, amen. Well, good morning. I don't know if I'm on or not. I think I am. All right, perfect. I came from this side of the stage this morning, which is really interesting because I usually come on this side. So if I'm a little thrown off, then I walked up on the wrong side of the stage this morning. Okay, so just letting you know that. Uh, now, I don't know exactly what this 30 minutes will entail because as a uh, sleep-deprived new father of four-month-old babies, who knows what will come out of my mouth this morning. No, I'm just kidding. I'm prepared. But if I stumble over, over my words, just bear with me. Okay, just letting you know that. Uh, But over the last couple of weeks, uh, Steve has been preaching on being all in with our mind. That was the series we started this month, and Steve has given us some great messages over the last couple of weeks, because the theme for our year, once again, is going all in for Christ, going all in for his kingdom with our lives. And as Steve has laid out quite well for us over the last few weeks, Uh, If we want to commit ourselves to Jesus and to his lordship, then we also have to choose to go all in with our thinking. And Steve has taught us that taking our thoughts captive and making them obedient to Christ, and as well as fixing our mind, creating new pathways, those are two things that we need to do in order to go all in with our mind. And this morning we'll be talking about a third way that we can commit our thinking and our minds fully over to Christ. And so if we want to go all in with our mind this morning, we need to reframe our thinking, okay? That's the title of my message, Reframing My Thinking. But what is reframing, okay? What is reframing? Well, reframing is simply creating a different way of looking at a situation, of looking at a person, of looking at a relationship in your life. Now, this morning, we're going to focus specifically on looking at situations in our lives, looking at circumstances that we might find ourselves in. But it's literally thinking differently about something that has happened to you in your life. It's reframing the situation. So let me illustrate it this way. What kind of day are you going to have? Is it going to be a great day? Is it going to be an average day? Is it going to be a bad day, a pathetic day? What kind of day are you going to have? Well, the answer to that question depends on how you frame it. It depends on what your frame is. For those that have a negative framework, or what we call a pessimist, a negative filter, it's going to be a bad day. I hate being around these people. I, these people are annoying. I hate going to church. The worship was bad this morning. The sermon didn't speak to me. I never get anything out of it. Life's bad, and it's only going to get worse. Right? That's one way you could answer that question of, are you going to have a good day or not? But if you have a more positive framework, it's going to be a good day. God is with me. He's here. I can feel his presence with me this morning at church. Some of these people are kind of weird, but hey, I'm weird too, so that's okay. 
right? And I'm going to choose to believe that I'm going to choose to believe the best is happening wherever I go, right? Those are the two ways that you could answer that question, right? It depends on how you frame it, right? It depends on what you're framed, the way that you view the day. It depends on how you frame it. See, here's what we need to understand this morning. You can't control the things in life that happen to you. And I don't need to remind most of you of that fact, but you can't control what happens to you. But you can control how you frame it, how you choose to think about it, how you choose to view it. That is something you can control. So I'll say it again. You can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. See, reframing is taking a situation and thinking about it differently. And if there was anybody who was great at reframing, I believe it was the Apostle Paul. If you know the story of Paul, you know he had a very strategic prayer plan for his mission, for his ministry. He would often pray for God to lead him where he needed to go, lead him by the Holy Spirit to the places God wanted him to preach the good news, to preach the gospel to lost souls. And the guidance of the Spirit didn't always lead him where he wanted to go. And in fact, in Acts chapter 16, we actually learned that the Spirit actually prevented Paul from entering certain places. Verses 6 to 7 tell us, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. See, Paul desired to preach in the province of Asia, but the Spirit actually prevented him. And Paul listened and he moved on. See, he was strategic. He was spirit-led in all that he did. And one of the places that Paul wanted to go and he prayed about going was the city of Rome. Paul prayed about being able to preach in Rome. He prayed about being able to visit the church that was planted there. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says to the Christians in Rome, I pray that now, at last by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. See, Paul was praying and praying to be sent to Rome. And I can imagine that he, he might have prayed something like this. God, please help me go to Rome. If I can go to Rome, if I can preach the gospel and reach the leaders in Rome, from there we can spread the gospel throughout the world. Well, finally, Paul got to go to Rome. His prayer was answered. But he didn't get to preach the gospel how he imagined. He actually came to Rome as a prisoner. Paul was in Rome because he was waiting to stand trial before Caesar. See, Paul's journey to Rome actually started all the way in Jerusalem, years before, where he was arrested because his teaching stepped on the toes of a lot of the Jews that were there. And this led to a very long series of trials for Paul. He stood trial before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. He was then transferred to Caesarea because they plotted to kill him in Jerusalem. He stood before two governors in Caesarea over the course of a number of years. And it was before one of those Roman governors in Caesarea that Paul took advantage of his Roman citizenship and appealed to be tried in Rome before Caesar. So he arrived as a prisoner and was placed under guard, under house arrest. And he was actually chained to Roman guards 24 hours of the day. And it was a new guard every eight hours that would chain himself to Paul. And he was also awaiting a possible execution. You see, what Paul envisioned would happen and what actually happened were two totally different things. So how did he frame the situation? He thought it was going to go this way. It went this way. So how did he choose to view it? How did he choose to frame it? Well, some of you, this is where you are right now. Maybe you thought, if I just got this promotion or if I just got this new job, I'll be much more productive at work. My life will be so much happier. I'll be so much more joyful. Well, you got the pr promotion, you got the job, and you're still feeling miserable. It's not what you expected. You know, you're asking yourself, is this it? Is this all I'm to expect? Or maybe you thought, I'm going to marry the love of my life. And it's just going to be the best. Nothing but sunshine and rainbows. But you married the love of your life and it went bad. 
And now you're asking, God, where are you in this situation? I'm sure most of us have been in Paul's shoes, that what we envisioned is not actually what happened. But this is where Paul was. I wanted this, but I got this instead. I wanted to preach the word in Rome, but now I'm a prisoner and my reach is very limited. What kind of day are you going to have, Paul? We could ask him that. What kind of day are you going to have, Paul? See, you can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. The way that Paul frames the situation he finds himself in, I believe can only be attributed to the fact that he was truly committed to going all in for Christ and all in with his mind, all in with his thinking for Christ. See, in the midst of being under house arrest and chained to a different guard every eight hours, here's what Paul writes to the Philippian Christians. Philippians 1, 12 to 14. Here's what he says. In the midst of being in jail. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now if I'm one of those Philippian Christians reading this for the first time, I'm thinking, hold up, Paul. You're telling me that being trapped in prison, chained to a guard every eight hours, is actually advancing the gospel? That doesn't make any sense. You need to be in the battlefield. You need to be out there in the midst of the people, in the harvest field, spreading the gospel. Imagine the reach you would have. Imagine the impact you'd have on people if you were free, if you were out there with full range. See, but then Paul says this, as a result, that is as a result of his imprisonment, It has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. See, Paul had every reason to give up in his circumstance. He had every reason to view this, to frame this situation negatively. And that's what I want you to see. He had every reason to live in negativity or to simply give up, to sit idly by and to wait for his freedom before he even continued being a witness for Christ. He could have sat and crossed his arms and pouted in prison before he even continued being a witness for Christ. See, on his way from Caesarea to Rome, Paul was hungry. He likely smelled, as did the other prisoners that were on the ship traveling. He was wrongly imprisoned. He didn't do anything to deserve the imprisonment that he was under. He experienced shipwreck. And to top it all off, he was bit in the hand by a viper, right? All these things that just went wrong for Paul. And now he finds himself in house arrest. But Paul didn't give up. He didn't give in to the negative thinking. He reframed his thinking and rather chose to view everything that has happened to him as a good thing that actually served, that actually helped his ministry rather than hurt his ministry. So how did Paul do this? Well, I believe Paul was able to do this because he chose a new frame to view his circumstance through. And I think this is what we can learn from Paul in this text, that we need a new frame, right? We need one. We need a new frame. When it comes to reframing our thinking, I don't believe it's simply enough to shift the focus of the frame over, right, to a new focus. Kind of like if you're you know, a camera that's shot on a desert wasteland in one scene and pans over and now there's an oasis. I don't think it's a matter of shifting our focus from this to that. I think it's a matter of tossing out the frame altogether and getting a new one. We need to throw out the old one and replace it with a new frame. See, the frame is the problem. I believe that when someone becomes a Christian, spiritually speaking, when someone is baptized and buried with Christ, In a spiritual sense, we are given a a new frame through which we view the world. I think Christ, you know, if you want to view it spiritually, you know, you want to picture it, you know, we're baptized and Christ has a new frame and he says, let me take the old one, here you go, here's your new one, right? This is how you should view the world now. So what is the new frame that we're given? Well, I believe the gospel is the frame through which we should view the world. The gospel is the frame through which we should view the world. The gospel is our new frame. It is the frame that I think Jesus gives us through the Spirit when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. It's the gospel that allows Paul to look at this situation, stuck in prison, chained to a new guard every 24 hours, 
with such positivity. See, Paul was not just trying to find the light at the end of the tunnel. It wasn't a matter of viewing the glass half full versus half empty. It's a, it was a matter of seeing reality, the reality of God at work in his circumstance. And the gospel is what allowed him to do that. Later in the book of Philippians, just a few verses after 12 to 14, Paul says this in verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of what? The gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of what? The gospel. See, Paul instructs us to live our lives in a way that's worthy of the gospel that we've accepted as believers. And I'm convinced that if the gospel is the standard for us to use to judge the way we live our lives, you know, is my life in accordance with the gospel? I believe our mind should be the same way. Is my thinking aligned with the gospel? Is that my frame? Is that my frame of reference for my circumstance? Is that how I'm coming to understand reality? See, I, the, the gospel allows Paul to be positive in the midst of the hardships he's going through. Every reason that Paul gave in Philippians 1, 12 to 14, as to why what happened to him is good, relates to the gospel. Number one, he straight up says, his circumstances have actually managed to serve in the advancement of the gospel. For Paul then, whether something is defined as good or bad, whether a circumstance is good or bad, for Paul, all has to do with how it's serving to advance the gospel. It's determined by the gospel or how it can be used to serve the gospel later. The second reason that it's good in Paul's mind is that the entire palace guard has now heard the gospel. Think about all the people that have heard the gospel. These were the guards that had access to Caesar. And we actually learned that some of Caesar's household later come to believe in the gospel. And I believe it started here when these guards, the imperial guards, heard the gospel through Paul. See, with the new guard chaining himself to Paul for eight hours, you better believe that every guard that chained himself to Paul heard the gospel through Paul's conversations or even through him dictating the letters to the churches, such as this letter of Philippians. See, because the gospel was his new frame, Paul was able to see how a tough and unfortunate and difficult circumstance was actually something God was using for good. The frame of the gospel allows us, by the grace of God, to see past what is immediately in front of us Sometimes we can be nearsighted, right, instead of farsighted. But the gospel allows us to see past what is immediately in front of us. The fears that we're experiencing, the frustrations that we're going through in these circumstances, the pain that we might be feeling, or the worry that we might have. It allows us to see past all of that and completely focus on the way that God is working and the way God is moving in our lives. The entire focus of the gospel frame is on God. The frame's focused on God. It's him at the center of the frame. It's focused on how he is able to use any and every circumstance and how everything that happens in our lives, he can turn it for good. It's just like in the song, See a Victory, the lyric that says, you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. God does that. Many of you here today know this is true because you've experienced God work this way in your life. But there is someone specific who I know in this congregation that can testify to the power of God and can testify to the power of using the gospel as the frame through which we view our circumstances, whether past experiences, present experiences, or even future experiences. Our own Kenny Maxwell has experienced this in his own life. Now, he's not here today because he's on an Emmaus walk this weekend. But thankfully, he's here in video form. So let's hear Kenny's story. On January, on January 1st, 1999, I was sent to a maximum security prison to serve 123 years. I was going to be separated from family, friends and loved ones, and basically sentenced to die behind bars. The last thing I would have ever imagined was that as the judge slammed the gavel down, that God would use this to advance his kingdom. Firstly, God advanced 
the kingdom of God from within. Uh, Jesus taught me while I was in prison to depend on him and to trust him. He started teaching me deep truths like Proverbs 18.10 that says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run to it and are safe. He taught me freedom while incarcerated, which is amazing. He said in John 8.36 that who the sun sets free is free indeed. And then one of the most powerful verses that, that I was taught while I was behind bars that I clung to like a life preserver was Philippians 1.6. It said that he that began a good work in you complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Well, through a series of miracles from God, you know, opening doors that no man can close, he changed my release date from August of 21-22 to August of 2018. His grace and kindness are so overwhelming that I cannot put it into words. The Lord allowed me to participate in the advance of his kingdom from without. Because when I was released from pr prison, he placed me uh, as an employee of the Muncie Mission, where I can freely minister the gospel to men who have walked the same roads that I've walked. And uh, he's allowed me to show them the love of Jesus. And I'm allowed to show him this love because I have been forgiven much. So he has made me free to love much. And the doors that God had opened, well now, he's allowed them to stay open. And I am able now, through his grace, to go back into the jails to tell desperate men about a desperate God. And the last thing that I wanted to say is that uh, Paul in Romans 8, I think it's 28, said that all things work together for the good for those of them that love God, that those who are, for those who are called according to his purpose. And I know it's true. Thank you. He says, Romans 8.28 famously says, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That good is the good of the gospel. That in all things God is continually making us more like Jesus Christ for the benefit of the gospel message in our lives. Kenny believed and still believes just that. He says that God used his imprisonment, which most of us would view as a bad thing. He said God used it to advance his kingdom within the walls of the prison, in his own heart so he could be transformed, and then he could have conversations with other inmates. And that God granted him his freedom so that he can be used outside of the walls of the prison. For the advancement of the gospel. See, Kenny's story illustrates perfectly the huge difference it can make in our lives when we view our circumstances through this new frame. It allows us to see how God is always working in our lives even when we think he isn't or feel like he can't possibly use the bad things that have happened to us. Because the truth is that every one of us has a story that God can use for his own glory. Right, every one of us has a story that God can use for his glory. Amen? Amen. The gospel is our new frame and should be our new frame as Christians. We can't hold onto our old frames anymore because they're broken. They're tainted by sin. They're no good. See, a young couple moved into a new neighborhood and into their dream home. And shortly after moving in, the couple sat at their kitchen table to eat breakfast. And the wife looked out the window and to her surprise, she saw her new neighbor hanging dirty laundry on the clothesline. That laundry isn't clean, it's still dirty, she said to her husband. Someone needs to teach her a thing or two about washing her, her clothes. A couple of days later, the couple sat down at their kitchen table for another meal. The wife saw her neighbor hanging clothes on the clothesline again. But this time, something was different. Wow, look, she said. Her clothes are clean. Someone must have taught her how to wash her clothes. And without raising his head from his plate, the husband kindly responded, actually, honey, I got up early this morning and washed the window. <laughs> Much like that dirty window the wife was looking through, our natural frames are broken, they're dirty. And they prevent us from looking at the world and the things that happened to us with truth and clarity. The wife saw dirty laundry, but the laundry wasn't really dirty, was it? 
I think the same is true in our lives. It was certainly true in Paul's lives. Paul's circumstances might have looked bad, but Paul was able to see what was really happening because he chose a new frame, which is the gospel. And any other frame that we try and use to understand things or try to view our circumstances from, they will not lead us fully towards the truth because they are broken and they are dirty, giving us only a mere vision of what might be. They cloud our vision. They prevent us from seeing things. But there are plenty of frames that we use besides the gospel that can hinder us from seeing the truth of God and going all in for Jesus. And I can think of three common false frames that we need to watch out for that we often find ourselves using in our lives. And the first common false frame that we tend to use is the false frame of reason. The false frame of reason. Some people try and let reason be their frame. But humanity is limited. Human reason is limited and can actually hinder us from seeing how God is working in our lives and in the lives of others. So I brought with me a, a frame from my house. And in this frame is a nice picture of Angelina and I on our, uh, about to go on our first date five years ago. So we look very young, okay? So if you get to look at the picture, you can see uh, how baby-faced we are, okay? Uh, but it's a great picture in a great frame. But what reason does is it takes the frame and it focuses on the border of the frame. It focuses on the limits, the limitations that reason can sometimes box us into. And what really happens is this nice picture actually gets hindered. And now we can't see it fully because we're too focused on the borders that we miss the picture, right? You can't see it from where you're sitting, but there's a little crack in between where you can see some of the picture. Reason lets us only see that kind of sliver. It only allows us to see barely anything, any part of the picture, because the borders are too thick, too strong, that we can't sometimes see what's going on. And that's the danger of using the frame of reason. When Paul visited the city of Athens in Acts 17, he actually came across a group of people who prided themselves on their ability to think rationally, to think with reason. Truth came through reason in their mind. So that was the frame they used to view the world. But as the story makes clear for us, it was actually their reason that prevented them from accepting the gospel. Acts 17.32 says, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. Because of the way they framed the way they look at the world, it prevented them to see how God was working or how God worked in history in the life of Jesus to bring them salvation. I imagine them thinking something like this. People don't raise from the dead. That's not rational. That's not scientific, right? That's just not possible. So that can't be what happened, so I don't believe it. But Scripture doesn't say without reason. There's a pun. Scripture doesn't say without reason in 1 Corinthians 1, 22 to 23, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block for Jews and foolishness for Gentiles. Of course, that doesn't mean that the gospel and reason are incompatible with each other. In fact, in a lot of ways, they are very compatible with each other. And the use of reason can sometimes lead us to a better understanding of the gospel and assure us of its truth. But as with all things, too much of anything can be unhealthy. I like to eat lemons, but you know what happens if I eat too many of them? I get sick to my stomach, right? I can get sick to my stomach because of all the acid that is going in. When we try and look at our tough circumstances and the bad things that have happened to us, it's easy to miss the positive things that God is doing because of our focus is far too narrow. We only see a little sliver of the actual picture. We get too focused on the bad that, we, that, that our frame is actually hindering us from seeing the rest of the picture. The second false frame that is commonly used, though, that we need to watch out for is the false frame of emotions. False frame of emotions. From one extreme to the other, it's common for us to rely too much on our emotions to give our circumstances meaning, how we feel. But just like the frame of reason, 
the frame of emotions can be very misleading. Emotions fluctuate. That's what they do. When we use the frame of emotions to try and understand our circumstances, what actually ends up happening is our circumstances end up controlling us. Our emotions are very easily influenced by the general mood that's around us. Have you ever walked into a room where you can just feel the negativity or the tension radiating off of somebody or off of the people in the room? I've been in a room like that and it wasn't much fun. Emotions can be dangerous as guides because it's so easy to let them control us and it can be so hard to control them. But unlike the frame of reason which closes the picture off, the frame of emotions has almost no border at all, if no border at all. There's nothing that actually keeps the picture in sight. We have all this background noise that's so easy to focus on rather than just the small picture that's in front of us. That we sometimes get caught up in what's going on around it that we can even miss the picture that's in front of us, right? We can miss what's really going on because we're too focused on other things. And that can be the danger of using emotions because it can be overwhelming there's so much happening there's far too much going on far too much happening to make any sense of what's really going on and when that happens we can easily miss how God is working in our situations and the bad things we go through I can think of no better example of this than when Moses sent 12 spies into the promised land to scout it out out of those 12 spies only two of them came back with a good report who were Joshua and Caleb. The other 10 came back discouraged and fearful. Their report was not an encouraging report. Numbers 13, 27 to 28 says, they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there a few verses later in Numbers 13, 31 to 32, we read, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. The 10 scouts that came back with a bad report they let their emotions dictate their response to what they saw. They saw big and built cities with massive fortified walls instead of seeing a bigger and stronger God who was behind it all. They only saw fear. They saw giant people in the land and advanced technology that they missed the God that was in control of it all and how he had a plan in mind for the Israelites. Their emotions got the best of them and forced them to focus on what was around them rather than who was behind it all, rather than what should be the focus of the frame. So fear, worry, and panic became their frame, became their response. And so they ceased to trust in the Almighty God. And we have a tendency to do this as well. We can see large and intimidating bills that we don't know how we can afford to pay and we let anxiety and fear slip in and we become blind to the God who has us in his hands we see pain suffering and sickness rather than the God who can take it all away we see trauma and mental illness because of the things that have happened to us and we let those emotions overtake us and we don't see the God who takes what the enemy meant for evil and can turn it for good our emotions love to focus on the problems rather than the almighty God who is in control. We miss how God is taking all of those things and using them for his glory through us because our emotions have us focused on everything that's on the outside of the picture, on the outside of the frame that our focus is off and not the center of the frame where our focus should be. And this leads to the final false frame that we commonly use that we should avoid and that is the false frame of self the false frame of self the false frame of self when you know places ourselves 
as the primary focus of the frame. So to illustrate this with my frame, we open our picture back up. We have this beautiful picture of Angelina and I on our first date, right? What the frame itself does is it decides to make myself the focus, covering up anybody else that's in the frame. It's a good looking guy, isn't it? <laughs> that's what the frame itself does, right? It covers up anybody else that's in the frame. See, we become too inflated for anybody else to fit inside the frame with us. And so we push them to the outskirts of the frame. We focus on how things benefit us or how they don't benefit us. And that becomes how we respond. When we go through hardships or trials, the frame of self places us at the center of attention. Maybe you've said some of these things, but we can start to think, I don't deserve this. Or what did I do to deserve this? Why is this happening to me? I can't handle this. Our mindset is totally self-absorbed. But when we focus only on us, we actually miss what God is doing in us, which is ironic. We miss what God is doing in us and through us in the midst of those hardships. We can tend to focus too much on how someone has hurt us or how much they have hurt us or how miserable we are when we are going through our hard times that we can't see how God might use or is currently using our hurt or our circumstances for the advancement of his kingdom. Back to our main text of Philippians. Paul was not focused on himself. I want you to notice that Paul didn't say, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what happened to me flat out stinks. I'm hungry, chained to a different guard, a smelly guard every eight hours. I have no personal space. I'm uncomfortable. I've been shipwrecked. And I'm just miserable. He didn't say that. Instead, he took the focus off of himself. He took off the frame of self and put on the frame of the gospel. And once he did that, he was able to see his situation as it really was. An opportunity for God to grow his kingdom through Paul. See, whether by word or deed, what happened to Paul served to advance the gospel. I suggest that it advanced the gospel more than if he came to Rome as a free man. The passage says that all the believers were encouraged to spread the gospel boldly. See, Paul recognized that God used him to encourage others to share the good news. It wasn't just enough for God to use Paul to be the one spreading the message. God wanted Paul to train others, encourage others to do that. And so now God has 15, 20, 30 people out there spreading the gospel. And now the reach has been even more extended than if it was just Paul. See, God knew what he was doing. And if Paul was too self-absorbed, he would have missed it. If we want to truly go all in with our mind, we've got to reframe our thinking with the frame of the gospel. Ask ourselves, where's the gospel in this circumstance? How is God using this circumstance? How, is, how might he use this circumstance? We've got to throw out the old and broken frames of reason, emotions, and self because they're all fallen. They've all been tainted and corrupted by sin and use our new frame of the gospel. When we use this frame, we will be more committed to seeing how God is at work in us and at work in others and how he is using our difficult circumstances and our past experiences for his glory. And when we have that mindset through our new frame, I believe that God can and will change our hearts and our minds for his glory. So this morning, would you commit yourself to throwing out the old frames with me? Would you commit yourself to reframing your thinking with the gospel so we can see the power of God at work in our world? Perhaps someone here today has never accepted Jesus and received this new frame. If that is you and you want to know more about Jesus or you're ready to accept him as Lord and Savior, then I invite you to make your way to our Next Steps prayer room on your left. Someone will be there to meet you and to talk with you. And you're invited to do that now as we stand here together as we close this message with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the way that it changes us because of what Christ has done. 
Lord, we know that the gospel is all about you. It's all about Christ and the work that you've done to bring us to you, the work you've done to rescue our souls, Lord. And I pray that, uh, Lord, this can be our new frame, that we can stop focusing on what's possible. We can stop focusing on, on how we feel in our situation. We can stop focusing on ourselves and we can put the focus right on you because you're the one uh, who's in control. You're the one who has power. And so, Father, I pray that uh, all of us here today, Lord, can commit ourselves to throwing out these old frames and to commit ourselves fully to viewing our circumstances as you would have us view them. That you would show us the reality of what's really going on spiritually so that we can be encouraged and that we can be all in with our mind. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. So we come to this time of communion. Uh, if you didn't get a communion cup when you came in, please raise your hand and we'll make sure we get you one. Uh, and if, you're, if it's your first time here or if you're new, and um, I'll do the communion meditation and then we'll pray and then the worship team will lead us a song. And at that point, you can take communion as you feel led. So it's a crazy weekend. It's March Madness one of my personal favorite times of the year. Uh, if you're like me, you get sleep deprived because I haven't been to bed until past midnight for the last what, two days. So, uh, but it's a great time of year. And if you watch the IU game, you didn't go to bed till yesterday morning. So, but it was still good to wake up and be a Hoosier yesterday. Uh, but nothing frustrates me more than people missing foul shots. At our house, watching an IU game go something like this. He, oh my gosh, that's five they miss now. Tammy goes, well, don't you think they, they, they want to hit them? If they did, they'd practice more. And she'd go, we'd go back and forth, and I'd finally look at her and say, you're not helping. <laughs> so, and then by the second half of most IU games, she's in the bedroom watching the rest of the game, and I'm in the living room by myself. <laughs> so, uh, but if you, have, if you follow basketball much, Steve Alford, who's one of the best college basketball players ever for IU, shot almost 90% foul shots for his career. And why did he do that? Well, he put up a lot of shots every day, he practiced. But he also was very, he had a routine. If you ever noticed, and, and growing up in high school, we played basketball and our coach made us shoot 100 shots before every practice. We had to put up 100 foul shots. And for every one we missed, we had to do up and downs, around the gym, up and overs, for every foul shot we missed. And, we still hold proudly the mighty Warriors of West Dell with a career, the season highest free throw shooting for a team with over 85%. But Steve Alford shot almost 90% for, and the reason he did it, every time he went up the line, he did the same thing. He put the ball down, he set his feet, he grabbed his socks, he stood up, bounced the ball three times, and shot the same thing every time. Why? Because he practiced, and it was a priority to him. On the other hand, Shaquille O'Neal, Shaq, as we call him, was horrible. He, and it got to be where they, in the NBA, they had a thing called hack-a-shack, because rather than let him dunk it, or th they just foul him, because they, they, he's going to miss the free throws. But he also famously said, I hit them when they count, when it matters. Now, I thought they kept the score from the start of the game to the end, so I thought oh, every foul shot matters. At least in my house, every foul shot matters. So, But I admit, I stress less if I DVR the game and I'm running behind, and I go home and watch it and I fast forward because I already know the outcome. So those foul shots that they missed don't bother me quite as much. It still frustrates me, but doesn't bother me quite as much. Do you ever wonder if God feels the same way about us? I mean, as we, uh, he sees us making the same mistakes over and over. He sees us struggling, worried, uh, concerned, fretting over the price of eggs, the price of gas, what's going on in this part of the world, that part of the world. And, and it, we are going to be concerned. But you ever wonder if God just says, you know, do you practice? Do you, have you been reading my word? Do you talk to me daily? Do you worship? Do you do the things that I've told you to do? Do you do these over and over? Do you practice? And if you look in the book, at the end, we know the playbook, we win. So we already know the outcome. So why do we stress during the little things of life? 1 Peter 5, 6 through 8 says, Humble yourself. There before, therefore, under God's mighty hand, he may lift you up in due time. Cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, 
standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. So as we come in and come to this time of communion, let's just take a time to remember that, that everything we're going through is not a shock to God. He already knows. And it's not unique to us because others are going through the same thing. So as we come at this time of meditation for our communion and we pray, let's just give all those anxieties, all those concerns, all those doubts and fears, let's just lay them at the foot of the cross and just trust that God has got, us, got it handled for us already, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that you are a caring God. And God, we just thank you so much that you already know the outcome. It's already determined. And Father, as we've been talking about discovery, Bible discovery classes, uh, about building momentum and and just building a fire for you, Lord, and, and starting that, letting that Holy Spirit just, just ignite and, and just create a, a powerful revival through us, Lord. And Father, I pray right now as we come this time, that if we have these cares, these concerns, that we would just lay them at your feet. We trust you for the outcome, Father. We just thank you and all these things. In your name we pray. Amen.
good morning, church. We're so glad that you were able to join hey, us. Good morning, church. We're so glad that you were able to join us for worship today. Thanks so much for coming out. We want to give you a few announcements of things that are coming up, some big, important things that we don't want you to miss. If you are a part of our Journeyman program, then Monday, March 27th, we are meeting here at 6 p.m. We hope to see you there. On Palm Sunday, April 2nd, if you're an impact greeter, we are having an impact greeter training that Sunday morning at 9.15 during our Bible Discovery Hour, right here in Education Room 202. Please be there. And Men's Night Out will be April Tuesday, April 4th at 6 p.m. and we'll be meeting once again at Porter Vallarta on Tillotson. Hi ladies, just wanted to invite you to our next Women's Journey meeting April 6th at 6 p.m. On Friday, April 7th at 6.30 p.m., our prayer ministry is putting on a Good Friday prayer walk. It's an event that you're not going to want to miss, so be here at, on Friday, April 7th at 6.30 for a special event. Hello, church. You know there's only one thing better than gathering together with the church family each Sunday morning, and that's gathering together on Easter morning when we can celebrate in a very special way the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and His victory over death and the grave. Easter's coming up. We want you to be a part of that special morning. We've got some great things planned for that morning. We're going to start with a sunrise service at 8.30 a.m. with a delicious breakfast, followed by a brief program led by our youth. After that, we'll have our Bible discovery classes, and then we will come back for just a wonderful hour of worship. We've got some special things planned for that morning. So get busy, invite your unchurched friends to come and join us that morning. Let's fill the house as we celebrate our risen Lord. Come and join us Monday evening, April 10th, for an exclusive UCC only tour and learning opportunity at First Choice for Women. Come and see how First Choice is making a difference in this post Roe v. Wade era and how we at UCC can be a part of that. The course will take place at 5 p.m. and 6 p.m., lasting for 30 minutes each, followed by refreshments and an opportunity for you to ask questions and for discovering how we can serve in that ministry. Space is limited to 20 people per tour per hour, and so you want to make sure you get your name signed up on that list. There's a sign-up sheet in the back of the Life Center, so please put your name on that list so you can be a part of that tour. Okay, the deadline is Sunday, April 2nd, so please put your name. Don't waste time. Sign up today. And last but certainly not least is on Sunday, April 23rd, is our church-wide movie night. We will be showing the movie Life Mark, which came out last year. We're meeting here at 6 p.m., so please invite a friend, invite somebody who doesn't have a church home or who maybe isn't a Christian to come out and watch this inspiring film. Hope to see you there. Church movie night, April 23rd, 6 p.m. Well, thanks so much for joining us once again. I hope you all have a blessed week. Thanks for uh, joining us this, uh, this morning for worship. Uh, I have one other thing to announce. Uh, Beth Schuller wanted me to let you know uh, for Easter Sunday, uh, we have a sign-up sheet in the back for breakfast, so uh, take a look at that and the foods they have listed there. Uh, if you feel led to bring one of those, put your name, put your name down. But it's going to be back there. So, uh, uh, is there a deadline for that, Beth? I don't know if she's in here or not, but I don't know if there's a deadline or not. So just take a look, and uh, it might be on the paper. So take a look at that paper, sign up for things uh, for that breakfast. It's going to be a great time. I'm looking forward to it. So, uh, with that, uh, let's go ahead and stand, and I'll, I'll dismiss us with a word of prayer. Uh, Father, thank you so much for bringing us here together for worship. I, I pray that as we go out uh, of this church, Lord, that we can be your hands and feet in this community. Uh, Lord, and I, I pray that we can give you the glory in all we do for this week. Uh, Lord, and uh, just uh, may you bless us, uh, bless this congregation. pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, if you could help us with the chairs, we'd appreciate that as we have youth group tonight. Thank you. <laughs>